सिक्स स्वामी निरंजनंदा एन आई विटनेस अकाउंट इज ऑफन इंटरेस्टिंग एंड कॉन्विंसिंग इट कैन पोर्ट्रे एन इवेंट इन सच विविड डिटेल दैट इट एनकिंडल्स द ह्यूमन इमेजिनेशन टू एक्सपीरियंस द पास्ट एज द लिविंग प्रेजेंट स्वामी अद्भुतानंदा अ डिसाइपल ऑफ श्री रामाकृष्णा narrated the following incident one day the master touched brother niranjan and for 3 days and 3 nights niranjan did not get one wink of sleep he had the continuous vision of a mysterious light and kept repeating the lord's name his tongue could not stop saying japam for 3 days prior to meeting the master niranjan was employed by spiritualists as a medium for contacting spirits So one day the master humorously said now my boy another ghost the holy ghost is upon you however much you try you will not be able to dismiss him god acts in mysterious ways in the early part of 1882 a group of spiritualists from calcutta heard about shri ramakrishna's spiritual power spiritualists generally strive for psychic powers and enjoy using them as it would be a considerable achievement to influence ramakrishna they went to the dakshineswar temple garden to test him they were told that ramakrishna had gone for an evening walk to jadu mallik's garden house nearby when they reached jadu's drawing room and met ramakrishna dr pierik and mitra the leader of the group introduced himself and the others including niranjan as spiritualists Ramakrishna had the power to see inside a person as one sees an object inside a glass case as soon as he saw Niranjan the master remarked this boy is very good extremely guileless immediately Pierre can said sir he is my nephew he can mesmerize very well and he is a wonderful medium shame shame don't get involved in such spooky business retorted the master dot to despite this the spiritualists expressed a desire to use their power to mesmerize ramakrishna the child like master agreed regarding this as a mere amusement moreover he wished to humble them ramakrishna sat on a chair and three spiritualists including niranjan and his uncle began to wave their hands about him the master observed their ritual and smiled from time to time After trying hard for an hour, Pierre Kent said, "Sir, you are a great soul with a strong mind. We are incapable of mesmerizing you." Then the master got up and said privately, "Dot to Niranjan, come here often." Three Niranjan, Nitya Niranjan Ghosh, who later became Swami Niranjananda, was born in 1862, probably in August, at Razrahet Vishnupur, District 24, Parganas. a few miles from calcutta his father's name was ambika charan ghosh niranjan was tall and handsome endowed with a broad chest and beautiful bright eyes he had a strong energetic and athletic physique his nature was fearless and heroic in his childhood he was fond of playing with a bow and arrows like the great heroes of the hindu epics He had a consummate passion for truth and deep compassion for the poor. When Niranjan was in his teens, he was sent to his uncle's house at Aheritola, West Calcutta, for higher education. There he was attracted by the group of spiritualists headed by his uncle, Pierre Kent Mitra. They made Niranjan their medium. He enjoyed the experience as one enjoys an adventurous game. Niranjan's mind was as powerful as his body. He had developed psychic powers that enabled him to cure illnesses. Once a wealthy man of Calcutta who had suffered from insomnia for 18 years sought Niranjan's help. The compassionate Niranjan used his miraculous power to cure the man. Later he said, finding the man suffering so much in spite of all his riches and wealth, I was seized with a feeling of the emptiness of all worldly things. The human mind grieves when empty. It always desires to behold an object. This passion for the world turns to passion for God. 
Disillusioned with spiritualism, Niranjan turned to Dakshineswar in his quest for spirituality. One evening soon after Niranjan had met the master, he went to Dakshineswar to see him. He found Sri Ramakrishna in his room, surrounded by devotees. The master was talking about God and how to realize Him. The devotees were spellbound. When all the devotees had left for home, the master approached Niranjan and expressed his joy at seeing him again. They talked freely for some time. Then the master said, My boy, if you allow your mind to dwell on ghosts, you will become a ghost yourself. If you fix your mind on God, your life will be filled with God. Now, which of these are you going to choose? Well, of course, the latter, replied Niranjan.5 Ramakrishna advised him to sever his connection with the spiritualists and Niranjan agreed to this. The master also said to Niranjan, Look here, my boy, if you do 99 good deeds for a person and one bad, he will remember the bad one and won't care for you anymore. On the other hand, if you commit sins 99 times, but do one thing to God's satisfaction, He will forgive all your wrongdoing. This is the difference between the love of man and the love of God. Remember this, 6 As it was getting dark, the Master invited him to spend the night at Dakshineswar rather than walk the long distance home. Niranjan said his uncle would be anxious and took leave of the Master, promising to come another day. Niranjan's feet moved towards Calcutta but his mind remained in Dakshineswar. Even at home Ramakrishna occupied all of his thoughts. He felt that the Master himself had possessed him, replacing the spirits. Within two or three days he returned to Dakshineswar. The Master was filled with joy at seeing him. He rushed to Niranjan and grasping his arms, exclaimed, O oh Niranjan, my boy, the days are flitting away. When will you realize God? This life will be in vain if you do not realize Him. When will you devote your mind wholly to God? Oh, how anxious I am for you! Niranjan was dumbfounded. What a strange man this is, he thought. Why is he so concerned about my spiritual welfare? Seven most people of this world have never heard of unselfish and unconditional love. Thus, if a person encounters such pure love, he or she tries to find the motive behind it. Niranjan silently questioned the Master's concern for him. In any case, the Master's words appealed to Niranjan more forcibly than any he had ever heard. He spent the night there and also the two following days. When he returned home, his uncle, who had been extremely anxious about him, scolded him and forbade him to visit Dakshineswar. Niranjan felt much aggrieved. Later on, however, his uncle relented and granted him the freedom to visit Sri Ramakrishna whenever he liked. Ramakrishna recognized Niranjan as one of his inner circle, an Ishwarkoti, a godlike soul who is perfect from his very birth and is never trapped by Maya. Once in a vision Ramakrishna saw the luminous form of Niranjan playing with a bow and arrows. Later he remarked that Niranjan had been born as a partial incarnation of Ramchandra, the training of Niranjan. As a good shepherd knows his sheep by sight, so Ramakrishna recognized the intimate disciples who had been born to carry his message. As soon as he met one of them, he would lovingly say, You belong to this place. He would treat each of them as would a most loving father. Swami Sardananda writes, Shortly after the arrival of such a devotee, the master would call him aside, ask him to meditate, and then under the influence of divine inspiration, he would touch certain parts of his body like the chest or the tongue. By that potent touch the devotee's mind would become indrawn and sense objects would vanish from its perception. His accumulated impressions of the past would be activated and produce spiritual realization in him. Besides touching the devotees in that way, 
The master initiated some of them with mantras. Eight Niranjan was initiated by the master with a mantram. He later described this experience. I was then working in an office. One day I went to visit Sri Ramakrishna at Dakshineswar. He wrote a mantram on my tongue and asked me to repeat it. What an experience! After returning home, even when my eyes were closed, I began to see innumerable fireflies in my room. The mantram was vibrating in my head and in every limb of my body. I wanted to sleep, but I could not stop the repetition of Japam. I had previously been unaware of this phenomenon. I became scared and thought that I would go out of my mind. After three days I returned to Dakshineswar and said to the Master, Sir, what have you done to me? After listening to my story, he laughed and withdrew the power of the mantram. He then said, It is called Ajapa Japam, the repetition of Japam effortlessly and unceasingly. Nine Ramakrishna's teaching varied from person to person. For instance, he scolded the mild-tempered Yogananda because he had not protested some false accusations made against him, but the master instructed Niranjan differently. Niranjan was habitually good-natured, but he had a violent temper. One day, when he was coming to Dakshineswar on the public ferry, he overheard some of the other passengers speaking sneeringly of Sri Ramakrishna saying that he was not a true man of renunciation but a hypocrite who enjoyed good food and every comfort, and whose disciples were gullible schoolboys. Niranjan protested strongly, but the speakers ignored him. At this, Niranjan became enraged, jumped to his feet, and began to rock the boat, threatening to capsize it in midstream. Niranjan was a powerful swimmer, he could easily have swum ashore after carrying out his threat. The passengers were frightened and they begged to be forgiven. When Ramakrishna heard about this incident, he rebuked Niranjan severely. Anger is a deadly sin, he said. You ought never to let it carry you away. The seeming anger of a good man is something different. It's no more than a mark made on water. It vanishes as soon as it's made. As for those mean-minded people who talked against me, they weren't worth getting into a quarrel with, you could waste your whole life in such quarreling. Think of them as being no more than insects. Be indifferent to what they say. See what a great crime you were about to commit under the influence of this anger. Think of the poor helmsman, and the oarsmen in that boat, you were ready to drown them too, and they had done nothing. Ten at one time Niranjan was compelled to accept a job with an indigo planter at Murshidabad, more than a hundred miles north of Calcutta. Ramakrishna was aggrieved when he heard of this and remarked, I would hot have been more pained had I heard of his death. A few days later, when he saw Niranjan, he learned that he had to accept the job to maintain his aged mother. With a sigh of relief, the master told Niranjan, Ah, then it is all right. It won't contaminate your mind. But I tell you, if you had done so for your own sake, I could not have touched you. Really, it was unthinkable that you would stoop to so much humiliation. Didn't I know that my Niranjan had not the least trace of impurity in him? Upon hearing this remark, a member of the audience questioned the master, Sir, you are condemning service, but how can we maintain our families without earning money? The master replied, Let him who likes do so. I don't forbid everyone. I say this only to these young aspirants, pointing to Niranjan and others, who form a class by themselves. 11. Ramakrishna did not want his intimate disciples to become slaves of lust and gold. On 15th June 1884 M. recorded the feelings the Master had for Niranjan in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. After the music the Master sat with the devotees. Just then Niranjan arrived and prostrated himself before him. 
at the very sight of this beloved disciple the master stood up with beaming eyes and smiling face and said you have come to to at you see this boy is absolutely guileless one cannot be guileless without a great deal of spiritual discipline in previous births a hypocritical and calculating mind can never attain god to niranjan i feel as if a dark veil has covered your face it is because you have accepted a job in an office one must keep accounts there besides one must attend to many other things and that always keeps the mind in a state of worry you are serving in an office like other worldly people but there is a slight difference in that you are earning money for the sake of your mother one must show the highest respect to one's mother for she is the very embodiment of the blissful mother of the universe if you had accepted the job for the sake of wife and children i should have said fi upon you 8000 shames 12 rama krishna had two types of teaching one was for the householders who are obliged to take care of their families and at the same time practice spiritual disciplines he reminded them constantly first god and then the world secondly he established the monastic ideal for his would be monastic disciples the sanyasi must renounce women and gold for his own welfare the sanyasi the man of renunciation is a world teacher it is his example that awakens the spiritual consciousness of men 13 ramakrishna was overjoyed to learn that niranjan was not attached to women and would not marry niranjan told him a woman never enters my thoughts on 15th july 1885 like a proud father the master praised niranjan to the devotees look at niranjan he is not attached to anything he spends money from his own pocket to take poor patients to the hospital at the proposal of marriage he says goodness that is the whirlpool of the vishalakshi a stream near kamrapukur i see him seated on a light 14 on that same day while sitting in his room at dakshineswar ramakrishna was chanting the names of gods and goddesses m recorded in the gospel then he repeated alekh niranjana which is a name of god saying niranjana he wept the devotees wept too with tears in his eyes the master said o niranjan o my child come eat this take this when shall i make my life blessed by feeding you you have assumed this human form for my sake 15 perhaps this sincere call of the master reached niranjan he resigned from his job and came to visit the master in an ecstatic mood ramakrishna told him you were living in an indigo house of such a place on this particular day you rode on your deputy's horse you stood in such a place with a bow and arrow Niranjan realized the master was all knowing with tearful eyes he surrendered himself to Ramakrishna saying sir all these days i could not recognize you 16 from that day niranjan visited the master frequently sometimes the young disciples would discuss the various riddles of life once in dakshineswar niranjan and others had a long discussion on free will and predestination unable to reach any conclusion they approached the master at first the master was amused by their naive ideas but then he commented more seriously does anybody have free will or anything like that it is by god's will alone that everything has always happened and will continue to happen man understands this last of all let me give an example of man's free will it is like a cow tied to a post with a long tether she can stand at a distance of 1 cubit from the post or she can go up to the whole length of the tether according to her choice a man ties a cow with the idea let her lie down stand or move about as she likes within that area similarly god has given man some power and also the freedom to utilize it as he likes 
That is why man feels he is free. But the rope is fastened to the post. And remember this, if anybody prays to God earnestly, God may move him to another place and tie him there, or lengthen the tether, or even remove it completely from his neck. 17 Ramakrishna kept close watch over the disciples' eating, sleeping, and day-to-day -day behavior. Since only a good student can be a good teacher, the Master uncompromisingly trained his inner circle disciples so they could become great spiritual leaders. Self-control and truthfulness are indispensable to spiritual life. Once, on seeing Niranjan take too much ghee, clarified butter, which was believed to create lust, the Master exclaimed, My goodness! You take so much ghee. Are you eventually going to abduct people's daughters and wives? 18 Another day the Master said to a devotee, pointing to Niranjan, Look at this boy. He is absolutely guileless. But he has one fault. He is slightly untruthful nowadays. The other day he said that he would visit me again very soon, but he didn't come. Hearing this, Niranjan immediately apologized in the service of the Master. In September 1885, Sri Ramakrishna had to move to Shampukur, Calcutta, for his cancer treatment. Niranjan left home and became the Master's gatekeeper, as he was strong and heroic by nature. There is an interesting story of how Niranjan was fooled by an actress. In 1884, when Sri Ramakrishna went to see Girish Ghosh's drama, Chaitanya Leela, he had been extremely pleased with Binodini, the actress who had played the part of Chaitanya and had blessed her. She in turn had become very devoted to the master but could not find another opportunity to meet him. Now, hearing of his illness, she longed to see him again. But the master's disciples were very strict about visitors. They feared that if Sri Ramakrishna talked too much or if he were touched by impure people his disease would be aggravated, most actresses were prostitutes at that time. In order to see the master, Binodini sought help from Kalipara, whom she knew through Girish. One evening, acting on his advice, she dressed herself as a European gentleman and went with Kalipara to the Shampukur house. Introducing her to Niranjan as a friend of his, Kalipara took her to the master, who was alone in his room at that time. Sri Ramakrishna laughed when Kalipara told him who this European gentleman really was. After praising Binodini's faith, devotion and courage, the master gave her some spiritual instruction and allowed her to touch his feet with her forehead. When Binodini and Kalipara had left, Sri Ramakrishna told the disciples about the trick that had been played on them. The Master enjoyed it so much that the disciples could not be angry. Following his doctor's advice, Ramakrishna moved from the smoggy environment of Calcutta to a garden house at Kos Sipore on 11th December 1885. Kos Sipore was then a suburb of Calcutta, but is now within the city and not very far from the Ganges. The master was quite happy despite his terminal cancer. On the morning of 23rd December, Ramakrishna gave unrestrained expression of his love for the devotees. He said to Niranjan, You are my father, I shall sit on your lap. Touching another devotee's chest, he said, May your inner spirit be awakened 21 by living with the master, the devotee's own love and devotion also grew by leaps and bounds. Once Niranjan went back home for a visit. When he returned, the master said, Please tell me how you feel. Niranjan replied, Formerly I loved you, no doubt, but now it is impossible for me to live without you. Then the master explained to M. Dot, This illness is showing who belongs to the inner circle and who to the outer. Those who are living here, renouncing the world, belong to the inner circle and those who pay occasional visits and ask, How are you, sir, belong to the outer circle? Twenty to the young disciples took turns around the clock serving the master. Moreover, 
they were practicing spiritual disciplines according to his instruction. They renounced hearth and home and surrendered themselves to Sri Ramakrishna. The following incident reveals how the Master protected his disciples. One evening Niranjan and a few other disciples decided to get juice from a date palm near the southern boundary of the garden. The Master knew nothing about this. When it was dark, Niranjan and others walked in the direction of the tree. In the meantime, Holy Mother saw the Master running down the steps and through the door. She wondered, how is it possible? How can one who needs help even to change his position in bed run like an arrow? She could not believe her eyes, so she went to the Master's room to see if he was there. Ramakrishna was not in his room. In great consternation she looked all around, but she could not find him. At last Holy Mother returned to her room, extremely confused and with much apprehension. After a while Holy Mother saw the Master running swiftly back to his room. She then went to him and asked about what she had seen. He replied, Oh, you noticed that. You see, the boys who have come here are all young. They were proceeding merrily to drink the juice of a date palm in the garden. I saw a black cobra there. It is so ferocious and it might have bitten them all. The boys did not know this. So I went there by a different route to drive it away. I told the snake, don't enter here again. The master asked her not to divulge this account to others. 23 After he had been at Kosipore three or four months, Ramakrishna's body became so emaciated that it was hard to recognize him. But his devotees still hoped that he would free himself from the cancer. During this time the master told Niranjan, Look, I am now in such a state that whoever sees me in this condition will attain liberation in this life by the grace of the Divine Mother, but know for certain that it will shorten my life. Upon hearing this from the master, Niranjan became more vigilant about his guard duty. He sat at the gate day and night with a turban on his head and a stick in his hand to keep outsiders from visiting the master. 24 Niranjan sometimes had to hurt people, but he accepted this as an unpleasant duty necessary to protect the master's life. A mentally ill woman used to accompany Vijay Goswami to the Kali temple at Dakshineswar and sing for Sri Ramakrishna. The master was fond of her singing but was careful about her as she cherished towards him Madhurabhava, the attitude of a wife towards her husband. This is a kind of spiritual relationship that some Vaishnav aspirants adopt towards Krishna. Once this woman came to Kosipore at noon and wanted to visit the master. Niranjan stopped her at the entrance. She then became hysterical. Hearing this, the master asked Shashi to escort her to him, and he blessed her. She then began to make more frequent visits. Niranjan adopted an unbending attitude and prevented her from visiting the master. Most of the young disciples were very apprehensive because of her unpredictable and seemingly violent behavior. However, when the woman was finally discouraged, she paid no further visits. Rakhal expressed his sympathy for the woman. He said, We all feel sorry for her. She causes so much annoyance and for that she suffers too. Immediately Niranjan remarked, You feel that way because you have a wife at home. Rakhal replied sharply, Such bragging. How dare you utter such words before him? Sri Ramakrishna, 25 The Master remained silent. He appreciated Rakhal's love and compassion for a suffering soul, as well as Niranjan's faithful service to the Guru. Another day, Ramchandra Datta wanted to visit the Master, but Niranjan stopped him at the gate. Ram was hurt by this because he was one of the Master's prominent lay devotees. He then said to Latu, Please offer these sweets and flowers to the Master and bring a little prasad for me. 
Latu was very touched and said to Niranjan, Brother, Ram Babu is our very own, why are you putting such restrictions on him? Still Niranjan was inexorable. Then Latu said rather bluntly, At Shampukur you allowed the actress Binodini to visit the master and now you are stopping Ram Babu, who is such a great devotee. This pricked Niranjan's conscience, so he let Ram go to see Ramakrishna. Later when Latu went upstairs, the omniscient master said to him, Look, never see faults in others, rather, see their good qualities. Latu was embarrassed. He came down and apologized to Niranjan, saying, Brother, please don't mind my caustic remark. I am an illiterate person. 26. This shows how the master taught his disciples to develop close interpersonal relationships. Once Atul Ghosh, Girish's brother, came to visit the master and was stopped by Niranjan. Atul was very hurt. Peaked, he took a vow that he would not visit Ramakrishna again unless someone personally came to his house and took him there. One day the master asked Niranjan to go to Atul's house and bring him to check his health. Atul, though not a doctor, knew how to check a pulse and evaluate the condition of a disease. Immediately, Niranjan rushed to Atul and brought him to the master. Even while he was sick, the master was training his devotees, sometimes humbling one and sometimes increasing longing in another. 27 During the winter Ramakrishna would bathe with hot water. One day Niranjan used a lot of firewood to heat a large vessel of water. That waste displeased the master. But Niranjan was stubborn. He carried the whole vessel of water to the master and said, Sir, I don't have enough sense to know how much water you need. Since I have brought it, you will have to use it. The master was pleased by Niranjan's simple and fearless behavior. It is hard for a lover to watch the suffering of his beloved. The real lover wishes he could relieve his beloved's suffering. While serving the master, Niranjan often worried about him. The master read his mind and one day asked him, Niranjan, if I were cured of this disease, what would you do? With great excitement Niranjan replied, Master, I would uproot that date palm tree from the garden. Knowing his heroic nature and his overwhelming love and devotion, the master remarked, Yes, you could do that. 29 The disciples took care of the master's body and he in turn took care of their spiritual life. He silently and naturally gave shape to this group of ideal characters. From his birth, Niranjan had been endowed with divine qualities, simplicity, purity, fearlessness, steadiness, truthfulness and renunciation. When the elder Gopal brought twelve pieces of ochre cloth and twelve rosaries, the master gave one of them to Niranjan and distributed the rest to other disciples. Thus Ramakrishna sowed the seeds of his forthcoming monastic order. When Sri Ramakrishna passed away on 16th August 1886, the disciples gathered his relics from the Kos Sipore cremation ground and put them into an urn. They brought the urn to the garden house and decided to continue their service. But they had no money, so Ramchandra Datta suggested installing the master's relics at Kankurgachi Yogodhyana, his retreat house. Niranjan vehemently protested against this. He, Shashi and some others secretly transferred the major portion of the master's relics to a separate urn, which they secretly kept at the house of Balaram Basu, a disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. In the beginning Narendra had yielded to Ram Babu's suggestion, but learning how his brother disciples felt, he supported their decision. Later, he installed this second urn at Belur Math. Pilgrimage and Austerity in December 1886, Niranjan, Narendra and several other brother disciples went to Antpur, the birthplace of Baburam. There they took the vows of renunciation in front of a sacred fire, not knowing that it was Christmas Eve. Sri Ramakrishna had created the hunger for God in their minds, 
and they began to spend their days in meditation and austerities. One day Sarada went to bathe in a pond. All of a sudden he slipped from a step and fell into deep water. He did not know how to swim. Immediately Niranjan jumped in and rescued him, ignoring any threat to his own life. In the early part of 1887 Niranjan joined the Barnagore monastery and took the final woes of sannyasa with his brother disciples. Vivekananda gave him the name Swami Niranjananda. He continued his spiritual disciplines and austerities in the monastery. He also helped perform the worship service and did most of the laborious work. One day he was carrying some sweets from the market for the master's offering. A poor woman, holding her little boy in her arms, was walking in the same direction. Seeing the package of sweets in Niranjananda's hand, the boy cried out, Mother, I want to eat sweets. The more she tried to control her son, the more he cried. Niranjananda gracefully went to the young boy and placing the packet before him, said, Please eat these sweets. The poor mother protested, Father, no. You are carrying these sweets for the Lord. It would be inauspicious if my son were to eat them. Niranjananda replied, No, mother, it would be all right. His eating would be the same as the Lord's eating. Handing the packet to the boy, Niranjananda returned to the market to buy fresh sweets for the master. Thirty after taking the woes of sannyasa, Niranjananda went to Puri on a pilgrimage and returned to the Barnagore Monastery on 8th April 1887. The monastery was in very poor condition. Because the disciples could not afford anything better, they were renting a dilapidated house for 10 rupees a month. They did not have a suitable altar in the master's shrine or accessories for worship. Niranjananda had heard about an aged but expert carpenter in Calcutta and had him make a beautiful altar for the master. With the help of the devotees, Niranjananda gradually collected a bed for the master, utensils and a Japanese gong for vespers. Niranjananda planted a bill tree on the spot where the master's body had been cremated on the bank of the Ganges and made a marble altar around the tree. He planned to set inscribed marble slabs in various locations connected with Sri Ramakrishna in the Dakshineswar temple garden, but this plan never materialized. 31 Sometimes he would go to Dakshineswar with Swami Viraj Ananda and meditate in the Panchavati or in the Master's room. Most people in this world live for themselves. But those who live for others really live in the highest sense. There is great joy in sharing and in serving others. Such joy eradicates selfishness and makes a person large-hearted. Whenever there was any problem or illness among the brother disciples or Holy Mother, Niranjananda would assume responsibility. Niranjananda nursed Yogananda when he was suffering from smallpox in Allahabad, served Latu when he had pneumonia and helped both Balaram and Ram up to the time of their deaths. When Girish was passing through a period of depression, Niranjananda took him to Holy Mother who lifted his spirits. In 1888, when Holy Mother was living alone at Kamrapukur, Harish, a devotee of the Master who was mentally ill, went there and began to disrupt her peace. Holy Mother subsequently complained to the monks at Barnagore and both Niranjananda and Sardananda rushed to Kamrapukur. As soon as Niranjananda arrived, Harish became so frightened that he hurried off to Vrindavan. Later he recovered from his mental illness. After Sri Ramakrishna's passing away, his disciples always took special care of Holy Mother and on the other hand, she looked after their welfare and inspired them. Many years later, referring to the hardships of the disciples, Holy Mother recalled, What an austere life they id at the Barnagore Monastery. Niranjan and others often starved themselves. They spent all their time in japam and meditation. 
One day they resolved among themselves, Well, we have renounced everything in the name of Sri Ramakrishna. Let us see if he will supply us with food if we simply depend on him. Neither will we tell anyone about our wants, nor will we go out for arms. Saying so, they covered themselves with their chadars, shawls, and sat down for meditation. The whole day passed. It was late at night. They heard someone knocking at the door. Naran left the seat and asked one of his brother monks, Please open the door and see who is there. First, Check if he has anything in his hand. What a miracle! When the door was opened, they found a man had come from Lala Babu's Krishna temple near the Ganges with various delicacies in his hand. They were overjoyed and became convinced of the protecting hand of Sri Ramakrishna. They then offered that food to the master and partook of the prasad. Such things happened many a time. 30 to denouncing spiritual disciplines and asceticism, worldly people believe that happiness can be derived from worldly possessions and sensual enjoyment. Spiritual people, however, find that happiness and peace come from within by controlling their worldly desires. Enjoyment cannot satiate the desire for enjoyment, it only increases desire as melted butter intensifies a flame instead of extinguishing it. In November 1889, Niranjananda left the monastery on a pilgrimage to practice further austerities. He first went to visit the temple of Lord Shiva at Deoghar and then proceeded to Varanasi, where he stayed in Banshi Datta's garden house and lived on alms. After that, he went to Prayag, Allahabad at the confluence of the Ganges and the Jamuna rivers. He travelled throughout various parts of India and then went to Sri Lanka. Vivekananda wrote from America on 22nd October 1894, Why doesn't Niranjan learn Pali in Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and study Buddhist scriptures? I cannot make out what good will come of aimless rambling. However, Swamiji was impressed with Niranjananda's preaching mission in Sri Lanka. Wherever he went, he would talk about the wonderful life and message of Ramakrishna. When he was in Raipur, an army officer named Suraj Rao met him and was greatly inspired. Suraj later resigned from his job and became a disciple of Swami Vivekananda. Afterwards, he became known as Swami Nishchayananda. In 1895, before Sri Ramakrishna's birthday, Niranjananda returned to the monastery, which had been moved from Barnagore to Alambazar in 1892, with Swami Vivekananda and others. Gradually the news reached the monastery that Vivekananda would return to India from the west in early 1897. Niranjananda left for Colombo and received Swamiji there on 15th January 1897. Afterwards, he travelled with Swamiji all across southern India as well as in various parts of North India. The brother disciples were thrilled and proud of their leader's success in spreading the message of Vedanta in America and Europe. In 1898, Niranjananda went with Swamiji to Almora then remained there in order to practice further spiritual disciplines. Sudhir, an initiated disciple of Swamiji, joined them. Sudhir was greatly inspired by Niranjananda, who initiated him into sannyasa on 16th September 1898. Sudhir became Swami Shuddhananda. He and Niranjananda then went to Varanasi and stayed at Banshi Datta's garden house. They continued their austerities as itinerant mendicants, begging food once a day, walking barefoot without sufficient clothing, sleeping on a blanket without a mosquito curtain, carrying no money, and depending solely on God's will. In Varanasi, Niranjananda encouraged a group of young men to enter spiritual life and to practice the ideal of service. In 1899, this group observed Sri Ramakrishna's birthday celebration under his guidance. Niranjananda inspired them to sacrifice their lives 
for the good of many and the welfare of all. This group later founded the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service and some of them received their monastic woes directly from Vivekananda. After staying a few months at Varanasi, Niranjananda went to Kankhal, near Hardwar, a place where mendicants live at the foothills of the Himalayas. Sri Ramakrishna had trained his disciples to build character first through practicing spiritual disciplines. A person of strong character truly speaks with authority. The monastic disciples had also learned from the Master that in order to teach others one must have no theft or hypocrisy in one's heart. Thought and speech must be united. Religion means the realization of truth. Renounce everything for God. The impact of an illumined soul's life is far more profound than the contents of thousands of lectures or books. When Niranjananda was in Kankhal, a young man from Varanasi named Kedarnath, later Swami Achlananda, expressed his desire to become a monk. At first the Swami discouraged him, saying that the life of a monk is very difficult. He quoted the passage from the Katha Upanishad. Like the sharp edge of a razor is that path, so the wise say, hard to tread and difficult to cross, 1, 3.14. But it is equally difficult to stay at home when the fire of renunciation burns in one's heart. Kedarnath gave up his job and left home. With Niranjananda's permission, he went to Kankhal in August 1899. Niranjananda received him cordially, taking him to a dilapidated house where he lived, which is across from the present Mahananda mission. The next day Niranjananda gave him an ochre cloth and asked him to repeat the name of Sri Ramakrishna. He taught Kedarnath the basic rule of monastic life, one must live on alms, without possessions, depending on God alone. 34 After some time Niranjananda became ill and left for Calcutta. A couple of months later he wrote to Kedarnath, My physical condition is extremely bad. It would be nice if you would come and give me a little personal service. 35. Kedarnath immediately went to Calcutta to attend Niranjananda, who was then living in a rented house at Bhavnicha, ran Datta Lane. Swami Brahmananda and the other brother monks arranged for his treatment and diet. It was a prolonged illness, and at one point he was close to death. Niranjananda was later moved to another location, Akhil Mistri Lane, where a devotee provided all of his food and paid his medical expenses. Unfortunately, Kedarnath also became ill and had to go to the monastery, which was now located at Belur. He later went back to Varanasi. Then Swami Premananda went to nurse Niranjananda and he slowly recovered. Niranjananda left no writings or any recorded reminiscences, but on 18th December 1946 Swami Achlananda described some of the important characteristics of Niranjananda's life. Swami Niranjananda believed that Sri Ramakrishna was the infinite God incarnated in human form and he who took refuge in him would not have to worry in his life. He had a similarly high estimation of Holy Mother. He believed that by the grace of the Mother, he could do anything. About Sri Ramakrishna he said, If anybody came to the Master and said that he wouldn't marry, the Master would dance with joy. He believed one should sincerely serve the Master, thinking of him as a living, conscious being, our very own. This is the supreme worship. The Swami did not put too much stress on rituals and mantras. He was a strong person and was not afraid of anybody. He considered the Master his only refuge. He appreciated those who had a dauntless nature. He had tremendous faith in the doctrine of service as established by Swami Vivekananda and he encouraged people to serve human beings as manifestations of God. He was a man of truth and wanted others also to adhere to the truth. He did not care for people who did not keep their word. He was extremely generous. Without any misgivings, 
He would take care of anyone who asked help from him. He would inspire young people to follow the path of renunciation and again caution them, saying that the path is indeed a difficult one. He said, it is important for a monk to live on alms or madhukari. As a bee collects honey from different flowers, so a monk is supposed to live by begging food from door to door. This is an ancient monastic custom in India. He himself would collect food like the traditional monks and then eat it after offering it to the master. He used to do physical exercise regularly and he encouraged the young men to keep their bodies strong and active. 36 Vivekananda went to the West again in June 1899. He returned to India in December 1900. Niranjananda was delighted to be with Swamiji once more. In January 1902, Swamiji visited Varanasi, where Niranjananda was then residing. He arranged for Swamiji to stay at Kali Krishna Tagore's garden house. At that time, Kakujo Okakura, the famous Japanese artist, arrived to escort Swamiji to Japan as a royal guest. Due to Swamiji's bad health, the visit was cancelled, but Swamiji travelled with him to Bodh Gaya and from there to Varanasi. Swamiji wrote to Mrs. Olebul on 10th February 1902, Mr. Okakura has started on his short tour. He intends to visit Agra, Gwalior, Ajanta, Elora, Chittor, Udaipur and Delhi. Niranjan has gone with Okakura. In the later part of February, when Swamiji became gravely ill, Niranjananda and Shivananda escorted him to Belur Mat. The doctors had been treating Swamiji for diabetes and kidney disease, but at Niranjananda's earnest request he took Ayurvedic medicine for three weeks. During this period, in accordance with the treatment, he did not drink any liquids except a little milk now and then to satiate his thirst. On Sri Ramakrishna's birthday Niranjananda became Swamiji's gatekeeper in order to prevent the general public from disturbing him. A young Brahmacharin, a disciple of Swamiji, arrived from Mayavati to visit him. Since Niranjananda did not know the young man, he stopped him at the gate. But while Niranjananda was talking to someone else, the clever Brahmacharin crawled through his legs and entered Swamiji's room. When Niranjananda heard this from Swamiji, he appreciated the boy's resourcefulness and dedication. 37 Niranjananda's character was a mixture of tenderness and sternness. He was an unattached monk and his love for truth was uncompromising. Once a rich man of Calcutta built a Shiva temple in Varanasi, ostensibly to acquire merit. When Vivekananda heard about it, he remarked, if he would do something to relieve the suffering of the poor, then he would acquire the merit of building a thousand such temples. When Swamiji's statement reached the rich man, he offered a generous donation to the Ramakrishna Mission Home of Service at Varanasi, in a nucleus state at that time. But later, as the rich man's initial enthusiasm waned, he decided to reduce the sum he had originally offered. This breach of promise so offended Niranjananda's regard for truth that he rejected the offer altogether, even though he knew it would cause great hardship for the institution. Niranjananda's devotion to Holy Mother was indeed remarkable. Swami Vivekananda used to say, Niranjan has a militant disposition, but he has great devotion for Mother so I can easily put up with all his vagaries. In those early days Holy Mother's divinity was not widely acknowledged, even Girish, a great devotee of the Master, confessed his doubt about it. Girish was then passing through a critical time, he had lost his wife and his son and was suffering from depression. At that time Niranjananda took him to Holy Mother and later accompanied him to her village of Jairambati. Girish stayed there for some months, with Niranjananda under the affectionate care of Holy Mother and derived immense spiritual benefit. 
It was partly as a result of Niranjananda's active preaching that many devotees came to recognize the spiritual greatness of Holy Mother. Towards the end because he had practiced such hard austerity, Niranjananda's health began to fail. During the last few years of his life he suffered from dysentery. The climate and water of Hardwar are better than those of Belur. Math, so he decided to move there and went to Holy Mother to receive her blessings. This last meeting was deeply moving as Niranjananda's pent-up devotion for Holy Mother suddenly found expression. No one understood the cause, perhaps he had a premonition that he would not live long. He insisted that Holy Mother do everything for him. He entreated her to cook for him and feed him as a mother feeds her young child. Holy Mother fulfilled his wishes. Before leaving, he fell at her feet and burst into tears. Then he silently went away, knowing that he would never see her again. At Hardwar, he lived in a rented house and continued his sadhana. His chronic dysentery was inexorably emaciating his body, but it could not stifle his renunciation. Sri Ramakrishna had enkindled his spirit when Niranjananda was just in his teens and it continued to shine brightly throughout the remainder of his life. He wished to complete the journey of his life alone. Towards the end, he was stricken with cholera. Like a hero, he took shelter on the bank of the Ganges and surrendered himself to God. When his attendant offered to serve him, Niranjananda declined. When the attendant nevertheless insisted, he said, Don't you want me to die in peace? 39 Then the attendant reluctantly departed. Swami Niranjananda, a heroic monk of Sri Ramakrishna, passed away in Samadhi on 9th May 1904. Later, Niranjananda's attendant realized the truth of Sri Ramakrishna's prediction, Do you know what these youngsters are like? They are like certain plants that grow fruit first and then flowers. These devotees first of all have the vision of God, next, they hear about His glories and attributes and at last they are united with Him. Look at Niranjan. He always keeps his accounts clear. He will be able to go whenever he hears the call.